thank you for, for making this extra time for joining us for this session. When we were planning out uh, today's launch, uh, everyone knows how these things go. There's an agenda. You get sent an agenda and exactly what to say at various points. It's quite formal. And, uh, and Manama said, eh, let's have some substance as well. <laughs> Classic, classic Monoma. So uh, <laughs> with that challenge, we, we stuck our heads together, um, and in particular, these three wonderful people from the center, Kevin Berriman, who's a PhD student um, with a neuroscience uh, background, uh, who's working with us uh, on the question of whether meditation makes us more moral. Good question. Uh, Jennifer Vint and Monoma Chatter. Philosophers, my very dear colleagues, were key members of the centre, um, part of the, the, the whole team, stuck their heads together and came up with this title of Transforming Consciousness. And we conceived this, they conceived this as essentially three perspectives on, the, on, on this very important question. Uh, and we'll hear from them one after the other today. Um, Craig and I will... will um, Scaffold it a bit, uh, provide a bit of, of commentary after the last of the three presentations, uh, and then we very much hope that we'll get a conversation going uh, with uh, everyone in the room uh, as we go along. So without further ado, I'll ask Kevin uh, to begin. Perfect. Hello. How are we all? Very good. Good to see you all here. So I'm going to start off this series of talks with uh, making a statement that it's, I don't think is very, very surprising. But so I've, I've done meditation for many, many years. I've done a lot of meditation. Um, I've, obviously, I've got the garb for it. I look the part. But I want to make the statement that I am not enlightened. I am not fully enlightened at all. I've done a lot of meditation, but I'm just not there yet. Um, but one thing that I have actually have from practicing meditation for so many years is I've had a lot of these very powerful and transformative experiences from practicing meditation. And so that's actually what I'm going to talk about today is how we really radically transform our conscious experience of the world through some kind of contemplative practice. I'm going to call these experiences awakening experiences, and I'm going to be talking about you know, exactly what they are. Uh, should we actually have one? Are they a good thing? How do we understand them? But then also, how do we actually live the rest of our lives if we've had one of these experiences? So obviously, if you look at the different contemplative traditions throughout the ages, different religions, different cultures, they describe these awakening experiences in very, very different ways in a different manner. You can say, say for example, they might call them something like very deep states of calm. They might call it something like ego disillusion or unification with the divine or, you know, oneness with God. But there's been some really good work done by uh, Andrew Newberg, David Yard and Mark Walden, who have actually synthesized a lot of these awakening experiences from these different cultures and different traditions. And have found that they actually share some very key components um, and also that there's a lot of uh, brain, the brain activity is very similar across these different kinds of awakening experiences. And the four key components that they say that these awakening experiences share is that the first is that there's a sense of unity about them. You know, that means that there's like a oneness with everything or there's a, you know, a, a unification with the divine or there's a sense of like set, a sense of separate uh, uh, a disillusion of self and other boundaries. The second uh, component that they talk about is uh, there's, a, there's a sense of intensity there. So like an emotional intensity, very positive po emotional intensity, like awe or boundless compassion. The third is that there's a sense of clarity there. You know, this kind of like everything finally makes sense. This is the most real experience that I could ever have. And the final component is that there's a sense of surrender there or the sense of acceptance. So this is, again, surrender to the divine or acceptance of this is just the way things are. So while these uh, awakening experiences, they do share these commonalities and they can, in a way, come about spontaneously, uh, they usually don't come about spontaneously. You do usually have to put 
a little bit of effort in and doing some kind of contemplative practice. Jenny's actually going to talk about some ways that our consciousness spontaneously transforms. So I'll, I'll hand it over to her to talk about those in a bit better detail. But so now we sort of know what an awakening experience is. It's like, should you have one of these things? Are they good? You know, I, I think they're pretty good. And one of the whole reasons when I started meditating, I was like, this is this is what I want to do. If the, like this is what it all seems like it's for. If I'm going to do this, I may as well like get that. And so once I started to get some of these kinds of experiences, it was I realized it was it was really disorientating. They're so powerful. They're so transformative. You don't know how to actually deal with them. So how do we actually deal with these experiences? Now, obviously, there's not really a lot of scientific, scientific consensus on how we deal with them. I really think that that's a worthwhile project to undertake if anybody wants to undertake it. But, but so I am going to have to rely a little bit more on the contemplative traditions to uh, frame how we actually understand these experiences. And so the first point I'd like to bring up about this is that because these experiences, they're so subjective and they're so unique, uh, the individual that has them really has to try to make sense of them themselves. And, but again, it can be very disorienting. So this is actually where some of the contemplative traditions or the wisdom traditions can actually really help you make sense of these experiences. If you find something that you have an affinity with, this can actually help orient, to, orient you. Say, for example, the wisdom traditions like Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam, or it could even be like uh, indigenous cultural belief systems or more modern things like more common humanity. Whatever, whatever framework you have an affinity for, this can really help you actually put this experience back together. And actually, Monam is going to talk more about how we use these wisdom traditions to make sense of our lives. If you have found something that you have an affinity for, then it's actually really good if you can find a community of practitioners as well that have had these kinds of experiences and can help you make a little bit more sense of them. And in like a perfect world, you'd find somebody that's really, really good and really proficient at them, some expert, some kind of teacher who can actually help you make sense of these experiences and give you a bit of a reality test against them. Now, this doesn't mean that the 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 contemplative tradition or the community or the teacher is right, uh, but they can actually help you and just guide you and sort of push you in the right direction. And so that brings me to my second point, is that while having an awakening experience, is, it is very deep and very profound and you take a lot of encouragement from it because it sort of means something's going right, you also shouldn't overestimate them too much. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, it doesn't mean that just because you've had one of these experiences, all of a sudden now you're like you're enlightened, you're a Buddha or you're a guru or an expert or something like that. I'd probably even go so far as to say you're probably not even quite a better person yet. You still have to do a lot of work. There's still a lot to do. And so you've taken a really, really important step there's still a long way to go. There's still deeper levels. There's still more you have to develop within your life. And again, this is actually where having a good framework, a good community, a good, a, a good teacher can actually help guide you in this process. The analogy I sort of like to give with these is, is just imagine like if you're going on a, on a trip across the ocean and you want to get to a particular destination and most people think it's like, oh, I've had an awakening experience. All of a sudden, I'm at the destination now. And what I usually say to people is, well, you're not quite at the destination yet. You've more, you've just, you've got the ship out of the harbor and you've pointed it in the general right direction. But there's still a long way to go. So you still have to continue to travel across the ocean. Again, that's where these, these different kind of contemplative frameworks can help you with that. And... But these things, they are, again, they're very important. They're a very, very good step and they're a very, very good reference point. So this brings me to the last point that I think is quite important if you've had an awakening experience is that now that we sort of understand a bit more about the subjective awakening experiences we might have had, how do you transform that into your external life? How do you transfer that out into the world and into your life as you live it? And for this, I actually think these kinds of four components are quite helpful and quite good. 
with a sense of unity, you can think of something like, well, how is a sense of unity uh, influencing me when I engage in the world? A sense of unity, how am I actually uh, uh, dealing with other beings on the planet, other species? How am I, what's my relationship like to the actual planet itself? The sense of unity of, you know, how am I ethically engaging in the world? Am I causing more harm? Am I helping beings more? If you look at something like a sense of intensity, these very powerful positive emotions, how are we actually using that with our family? Uh, how are we using that with our friends? But also how are we using this sense of intensity, this kindness and compassion with beings that we may never, ever meet? Also, if you can look at something like a sense of clarity as well, you can think as well, how am I actually using a sense of clarity in my life with the kinds of priorities I have, the kinds of decisions I make? Uh, how am I spending my life? How am I spending my time on this planet? Who am I spending it with? What am I spending it doing? doing? And finally, with a sense of surrender or a sense of acceptance, are we always living our life along the lines of, I just want to get the thing for me, I don't care about anybody else, or are we actually you know, giving over something of ourselves for the greater good or are we able to just accept the world for the way it actually is so this is probably around about my time I'll, I'll wrap it up here um so i think awakening experiences are great i you know, if anybody has never had one i really do hope you've had one i don't have a good reference point i don't have children i never bought a house so i think like awakening experiences are really really great so i do hope you all have one at some point <laughs> And so now that I've talked about these really radical ways you can transform your consciousness, I'm going to hand it over to Jenny now, who's going to give you a really, really interesting counterpoint of how it actually changes just by in the, in the, in spontaneously. So thanks for that. Okay, so uh, over to Jennifer Bint. Uh, Jennifer is uh, an um, Australian Research Council uh, fellow. Uh, the author of Dreaming with MIT Press, the authoritative uh, book on the uh, role of dreaming in consciousness uh, science and uh, has a flourishing research program up in the center. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jakob, for the introduction and thanks, Kevin, for the talk so far. Thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, you'll, you'll give me time? I'll say two minutes, one minute. Okay. Um, so Kevin was telling us about large-scale we would say, transformative experiences and ones that are brought about through with a lot of patience and discipline and cultivation. They might come spontaneously, but I think in many cases they'll take many, many hours and many, many years of work to bring about and facilitate. They require reflection and assessment. And as Kevin was indicating, I'll talk about the other side of things, a type of transformation that is really a constant current that runs through our stream of consciousness, our thoughts and experiences that's happening all the time that can often be more subtle and in fact often be so subtle that we don't even notice that it's happening or forget it immediately after it has happened. Um, it's also a kind of transformation that is completely effortless. Um, the transformation I am talking about um, is best understood and I think most strongly exemplified through the example of dreaming and mind wandering. Um, in fact, a large, a, a, a gigantic proportion of waking life is spent mind wandering. So thoughts and attention drift away from the here and now, from whatever you're currently doing, from your ongoing tasks. Even when you're trying to attend, attention still has a way of being unruly and going away on its own. Um, up to 50% of waking life in healthy, sober, awake adults is spent mind wandering. And you can imagine that that proportion would further increase um, in certain conditions, in, in exhaustion, in uh, certain mental health conditions, and so on and so forth. Likewise, sleep teems with conscious experiences. We're not dead to the world in sleep, far from it. Uh, we can have certain types of experiences as we drift off from waking into sleep. Um, dreams are the most vivid example, but we also have numerous thoughts or residual bodily perceptions that still occur 
throughout sleep and in all stages of sleep. New research is suggesting that mind wandering and dreaming are in fact linked um, both phenomenologically and in terms of the underlying neurophysiological processes. And in fact, it has been suggested um, that dreaming might be an intensified version of waking mind wandering. So in other wise words, the, the, the concept of daydreaming can be taken quite literally um, in this respect. Now, dreaming and mind wandering are spontaneous. As I was saying, they largely occur outside of our awareness and largely, with some exceptions, occur beyond outside of our deliberate control. But I think they can actually give us insight into something surprising, into, into mental autonomy, which I would define just as the ability to take control of your mental life and quite literally to change your mind, to bring about a transformation that you want. So it's a bit surprising that states that we would traditionally or often intuitively characterize as states of mindlessness um, in opposition and oppose them to mindfulness um, can actually portray the key ingredients of mental autonomy and freedom to change. I think to do so, we can look at these states and focus on two basic ingredients that I think they have that we need to have mental autonomy in a stronger sense. And those are freedom from immediacy and freedom from repetition. And I'll talk about those in, term, in turn. So freedom from immediacy is just the freedom to detach from the here and now, to take a step back and move your attention elsewhere. It's an attention, a freedom then to focus on something else, a freedom possibly to choose whether you want to engage with what is happening or with something else, and possibly even to choose what that something else might be. We have that in a very strong sense in sleep. When we're sleeping, and especially when we're dreaming, um, there's a very low-level physiological story to be told about why we're cut off from events in the environment and how diff differently we're actually processing, for instance, sounds as we would in wakefulness. Likewise, in mind wandering, we have the same detachment. Mind wandering is often described as task independent and stimulus independent thought. And you can also see that that kind of detachment is extremely or can be extremely costly in the short term. So um, think of you know, attention demanding tasks such as driving or operating heavy machinery, sitting in a lecture, reading. Performance on all of these things is going to be quite compromised if you fall asleep or even just if your mind begins to wander. But at the same time, um, I think this potential to detach is also can be an extremely valuable thing in the longer term. If we didn't have it, we couldn't learn from our memories and past experiences. We couldn't plan for the future. We couldn't take a step back and think about how things could be otherwise or how we could position us in a different way relative to what will happen next. Um, but freedom to detach is not, and freedom from immediacy isn't all we need to bring about transformation and have mental autonomy. We need another kind of freedom, and that's freedom from repetition, I would call it. We also need, we don't just need to free ourselves from the constraints of what is happening right now around us. We also need to free ourselves and take a step back from the constraints of the past, of our past experiences and of our cognitive habits. And again, I think we see Firstly, that this freedom from repetition is also a freedom to do something else, to do something differently, to create something new. It's a freedom to bring some kind of novelty and change um, into our thoughts and our actions. And again, we see this quite strongly in dreams. Dreams are, if anything, they're novel, they're bizarre, they're often odd, they're fantastic. They're not, often no they're not always novel in a useful way, but they're often novel in a slightly odd and interesting way that has the potential, sometimes, maybe rarely, but yet a promise to bring about some real insight. And we can also see what happens, um, and similarly for mind wandering, I think mind wandering is strong, it's strongly centered on the self, on self-related concerns. It's often focused on the past or towards the future, but it also can dream up, as in daydreams, just really alternative scenarios. It's almost as if you could temporarily try on being in a different environment or being a different self. I once had a dream years ago that was long before I had children and long before I wanted to have children. I had a dream that I was out with my family of small children and I was the father. I have no idea what that was inspired by. It certainly wasn't. It was one I thought was interesting. It, cer it certainly didn't change my mind about anything. Um, 
But I think it just shows that dreams really have the potential and also daydreams to a possibly lesser extent to allow us to try on a different perspective or even to try on being another person. And that can be a source of insight if you choose to make it so. Um, we can also see how this can break down, both in dreams and in mind wandering. So in rumination and sticky thought, going in circles again and again, um, we see that these things are also recurrent nightmares, that they are often um, cases where dreaming and mind wandering have broken down this ability to innovate and think in different terms. They can be signs of poor emotional adjustment and ill being. Um, so conversely, um, I think having that novelty can be interesting and that detachment and useful, even if the content of what we're thinking about or dreaming about isn't in itself insightful, it can still be useful and helpful to have that cognitive ability to detach both from the, from the present, from your environment, and from your past. So I might just end by giving a brief reflection on whether we can harness the benefits of mind wandering and dreaming and make the best of them. Because I think that's the pressing question that many people will have looking forward. And I would say, well, on one hand, science hasn't fully understood the costs and benefits of spontaneous thought of mind wandering and daydreaming. But I think there's also um, a note of caution here. If we tried to fully harness these states, we would be turning them into something else. They're by definition spontaneous. We can't fully harness them or control them without turning them into something else. But we can perhaps nudge them in some direction or another. We can perhaps learn to accommodate the fact that our minds wander and our attention shifts in our everyday life and try to make it more useful and less costly. Finally, I think we can learn from looking at these states. I think we can learn something about ourselves as conscious beings in general, but potentially also about our personal lives. And I think at least sometimes a transformative dream or a transformative mind wandering might hold the potential or give you the choice to think about, hmm, do I want to endow this with meaning? Do I want to scale it up to something bigger or not? And I think that in itself is a quite interesting and promising project. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Now uh, I'll hand over the word to uh, Mona Machetta, who's an associate professor in the uh, uh, philosophy department. Monoma is one of the world's foremost experts on Buddhist philosophy, working on interesting questions like whether if you don't have a self, can you then be morally responsible? Uh, Stay tuned for Monomer's uh, book, which will come out soon with Oxford University Press on this topic. Over to you, Monomer. Thank you, Jakob, and thank you all for coming. It was my bad idea <laughs> to do this, but, um, you know, with this sort of thing, I, I really felt that we need, we need to be able to give something to people to think about, at least for a while. And my very capable colleagues have already done it. So I don't have too much pressure now. <laughs> I like to think of contemplation as wise transformation. Jenny just told us, you know, we are, our consciousness is transforming all the time. But when, you know, we contemplate, we think deeply about something, we make a decision, you know, we, we consciously decide to think deeply about that thing. We contemplate, and I think our contemplation is influenced and informed by the wisdom traditions. That's why I call it the wise transformation. Um, and I think of the religious traditions, the great religion, religious traditions as wisdom traditions, but I also think what I do, philosophy, um, as a wisdom tradition. It was so in ancient Greece, in Asia, it is still so. You know, we think of, we do not think of religion and philosophy and science as separate enterprises. There was just, you know, w wisdom, knowledge is what we were after. Um, that is how it was conceived in ancient times. Um, what do the wisdom traditions bring to the table? You know, what are they offering us? They offer us metaphysical frameworks, some views about what there is. Some wisdom traditions have a god, some have no self, Buddhism. 
Some have a self, Hinduism. Philosophers talk about the ultimately real thing. You know, some philosophers think consciousness is the only real thing. They're a bit obsessed, but you know, we'll <laughs> leave that. Um, you need to be a bit obsessed when you do philosophy. Uh, so you have to excuse us with that. Um, but, you know, when it comes to thinking about the ethical frameworks that these traditions bring, there is a constant theme, and which has already come up in what Kevin said about, you know, feeling the connection with others, feeling that we are not isolated individuals. Compassion is the thing that all the wisdom traditions promote. And I think they do that because there is one belief that all the wisdom traditions, including philosophy, share, that there is suffering in the world and we have to do something about it. And I think the other thing to add there is what they tell us is that to you know, do something about the suffering, we do not need to just do our democratic duty on Saturday morning and leave it at that. We need to change ourselves. To change the world, we need to transform ourselves. That's the message, I think. You know, no wisdom tradition says, you know, go and give a lecture. <laughs> Perhaps, you know, sit and meditate, but no going out and giving talks and, you know, um, trying to mobilize the rest and so on and so forth. So I think taking that message seriously from the wisdom traditions that we need to transform ourselves, that's how we can do something about the suffering in this world. We all recognize it. You know, there is no, it's not a, about my suffering. We've all been through experiences in which we suffer, but it's not about an individual suffering. It's just the existential fact of suffering. There is suffering in the world. The first noble truth from the Buddhists. Anyway, okay, step back. Um, what is contemplation? I am no expert. I do a little bit of meditation, but I'm not even as, you know, not even close to Kevin um, in the number of hours I spend meditating. So I will turn to the um, experts here. I've got here a quote from um, St. Augustine about what um, it is to contemplate. Here is what he says. It is to turn attention inward. But what are we to find? To turn, atten to turn inwards is to find oneself in the library of one's memories, walls stacked up high, waiting to be pulled down, and others more re remote, which can be called from the stacks. So what is contemplation? Turning attention inwards. Finding what? Finding oneself. You could have just gone to the mirror, but no. Uh, finding oneself in the library of one mem one's memories. And I think here is where the, where the, you know, some of the philosophy and the psychology of um, mental states comes in. What are memories? How do we store them in the head? We tend to think, you know, of memories as scenes in the head, but you're mistaken. They're just impressions. Memories is something you create in the here and now. You know, we reconstruct our memories given our present goals, our present wants, our present beliefs. We make up memories. We reconstruct them. That's what the evidence from the sciences is telling us. There are no memories, no scenes, no matter how important the occasion is. When you relive it, you tell a different story to yourself and the rest of the world. That's what memories are. And in the process of reconstructing these memories, you are recreating yourself. That's what, that's what Augustine had in mind. He said, you find oneself. He didn't say, you know, it's the old self. You find oneself anew, recreated in every memory that you relive. That's what you do. And if this, you know, so what is it that one finds? One finds recreating memories and recreating the self in the process of doing uh, this, in the process of living again important parts of our past. 
we are making ourselves afresh. What happens in, you know, if you um, are in a contemplative tradition, your goals, your intentions, your wants are, you know, informed by the ethical frameworks that I just mentioned, compassion being the most important one. And we are often, you know, given a chance to recreate ourselves afresh. I'm going to finish by coming back to the awakening experiences that uh, Kevin started with. What happens in one of these ex awakening experiences? Let's um, stick to one feature, thinking about the sense of unity. Well, we feel a sense of unity with the rest of the world. The Buddhist tradition, I'm going to come back to it. Um, what's the no-self? It's talking about breaking barriers. You know, that's the message. Breaking barriers between oneself and the others. You know, we are all interconnected. There is no unique self. They're not saying you don't exist. You know, there is no unique you that will continue into the future. How you evolve, what you will be, is going to depend on, you know, your community and everyone around you. And so, rather than, you know, thinking about ourselves, we need to think about the collective, all of us. That's the no-self. There's nothing more to the Buddhist no-self doctrine. But whatever more it is, there is in my boring book. <laughs> It'll come. Um, but, you know, um, so when one has one of these awakening experiences with the sense of clarity, with the sense of intensity, and um, with surrender, what one does is it gives us a chance to completely resets, reset our goals, our wants, our desires. It's a complete, it's an opportunity to create oneself anew, totally afresh, with a new, you know, set of ways of recreating our memories. So when we think back to, you know, one's graduation, it was not about me walking away with my PhD. It was, you know, what my parents felt, how proud they were, my supervisors who had put in so much, you know, to get me to that podium and to walk away with that degree, my friends, you know, and so on in the broader community. And Monash, I'm a graduate of Monash. Um, but I will stop there. Um, hope uh, you enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh salesmanship of your book there, Marma. Uh, <laughs> um, we'll now uh, ask Craig to comment, ask some questions and so on. And while he's doing that, please pluck up the courage uh, to reflect on, comment on, ask questions. There's no wrong uh, questions at all, and we'd love to hear uh, from, from all of you. Um, Craig? Uh, brilliant. Um, thank you to everybody. for. Uh, there are so many questions in my mind. One of the questions is, anybody here like a transformational experience on the way out today? <laughs> or an uh, awakening experience? So, Kevin, my first question is for you. I'm not sure if you're going to hand them out at the door on the way out or this I sort of... I don't have a bag. Hmm? I don't have a bag. <laughs> no show bag. Um, so... This sort of issue of sitting down, uh, meditation, contemplation, oftentimes with a strong desire to have an experience, and does that desire actually get in the way of awakening? If so, how do you navigate your way around those sort of rocky sort of seas of trying and striving and wanting and getting? How can you get past that to actually have an awakening experience? Yeah, it's. I think it's. It's the, one of the most common experiences that we all actually have when we do take up a serious meditation practice, and we think, okay, if I'm going to sit here in pain for three hours, I want to get something out of it. <laughs> and so you do really try to actually have these, but there is, in some sense, you do have to let that desire go. Uh, once you actually truly do let that desire go go to have these things, that's when they will start to more come about by themselves. It's, you know, how do you actually do that though? You do that through a lot of wanting to do it and then realize that 
realize that you you wanting to do it is getting in your way. So you you sort of have to go through the hurdles of actually doing it before you can actually go, well, I just need to let this thing go. And then when you finally do let this thing go, that's when these experiences can come about a lot more. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. There's a bit of a paradox involved there. Am I allowed another one, Jakob? So, uh, uh, Jennifer, um, I was this mind wandering, uh, and I was wondering about its relationship to creativity. That are these the kind of also the creativity circuits and capacities of the brain, and how does that therefore link with mindfulness? Like when, if we're more mindful, can we use that? imaginative capacity of the brain but in a much more conscious sort of way in a much more discerning way and when we're not mindful are those imagination circuits in our brain just running off here and there creating catastrophes and disasters and anxiety and negativity and so on so um can you say something about this mind wandering mindfulness creativity relationship I can try. <laughs> <laughs> so I think clearly the question of creativity um, and insight is one that has been out there and thinking about mind wandering and dreaming for centuries. I mean, that's one of the key reasons why people have been interested in these states. And I think, to my mind, one of the key issues there is is keeping a balance. So clearly there are those examples where you would have, you know, a really amazing insight or some creative idea or something from an episode of mind wandering hit upon it spontaneously, leave your desk and that's when you have the good idea kind of. And likewise that dreams can bring this about, but my personal assessment and um, I think this is also backed up by research that's out there on on creativity and mind wandering and dreaming is that the vast majority aren't like that. So it's kind of almost like a chance discovery that you might have. So that's the one aspect of it. I think at least most of the time in those spontaneous states, they're actually quite mundane. They're a little bit weird. But then there are those ones that stand out. And those are the ones that I think have the promise and potential to use them for something more if you so wish. I think the other side of it is how can maybe mindfulness and contemplation help channel that. That's something that I heard in your question there as well. And there's a quite nice model um, on how creativity, creative thought relates um, to mind wandering and also to dreaming um, from a Canadian researcher. So Kalina Kristoff, who I've been incredibly inspired by, um, she has this idea basically that from focused thought through creative thought, mind wandering and dreaming, these states are all on a continuum. And she says with creative thought, really the thing is you have almost the generation of the idea, the generation of the insight that falls in her newer work. She's been saying that falls on the side of spontaneous states of mind wandering and dreaming. But then picking that out, evaluating it and assessing, assessing it. And as I would say, as I would say, endowing it with meaning and lifting it up to something more, that falls on the side of focus and reflection. So I would say maybe it's also a matter of using then a more focused and more contemplative approach to pick and choose what from there you want to keep and what you want to discard. And maybe even being aware of everything that was going on there in your mind that you otherwise would never have remembered in the first place. So I think there's kind of that element to that as well. Mm. Can I... Monimo, um, just uh, you're talking about memories and and recollection and when Plato talks about recollection, he said all learning is simply recollection. But that kind of learning he was talking about was really wisdom, like when we have a moment of insight, uh, profound insight or wisdom, perhaps in a moment of clarity, that recollection is actually something that was buried, it was there, it was in the library, say, but we had never been able to put our hand on that book. Is that kind of recalling those moments of insight different to the other kind of memory, which is I had one of those uh, curried egg um, uh, sort of sandwiches uh, during the end and, and uh, you know, is, that, is there a different kind of memory here? And if so, which one was Augustine perhaps really uh, valuing the most? Interesting. I mean, uh, Plato did talk about, you know, um, memory is just... Um, Sorry, memory is just, um, you know, 
all knowledge is just memory. We all know it. You know, it's already there in the soul. It's just a matter of rediscovering. But I think the kinds of memories that Augustine has in mind um, might be slightly different from um, those um, in some sense. And I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, sort of link it to the current research um, on memories to to make the point. Um, so. I mean, one, the kind of memories Augustine had in mind are memories in which one finds oneself. You know, there are, there's lots of, lots of knowledge we have in what is sometimes called semantic memory. It's knowledge about facts. Um, you know, that's one kind of memory. But there's another kind of memory that's really important to us, which is episodic memory or, you know, where we relive those you know, uh, things in our past, those kinds of memories contribute to our sense of self. They tell us who we are. And that was the kinds of memories, I think. It was not just about, you know, knowledge and what we know and what there is and, you know, that wonderful insight um, that led to the breakthrough in a scientist's work. That's not the kind of uh, things I think that Augustine is interested in. He's interested in personal memories of our personal past because they, you know, they endow meaning to our lives. They give us a sense of, they make us who we are. And I mean, in a way it will, you know, these kinds of memories, our sense of who we are, will affect how we act in the future. So that was, um, I think, what he had in mind. Thank you. Okay. So now we open the floor. Um, just wave at me, and I'll try to remember where you sit. A constant first. I pick up a word which, Craig, you just mentioned in passing, but I didn't hear it so much from the others. Everything that you said was very good, but the word imagination, um, as I come from the, the background, the medieval background, where the, uh, the process of understanding goes from sense, imagination, and then reason, almost reason reflects on the images, and so this was perhaps particularly for Jennifer, but it sort of um, it struck me that what you were saying could be said about imagination. I'm not quite sure you didn't actually. I can't recall. Maybe you didn't use the word in itself. But is imagination? My sense is that it's fundamental to the process of consciousness. But I'm just curious to know um, what the thoughts are. Ah, oh, absolutely, and I and I did not use the word, but I think imagination is um, absolutely central both to the topic of dreaming and of mind wandering, and actually bound up with a lot of what that is. So there are a lot of academic discussions that I won't bore you with here about whether kind of dreaming is a form of imagining or more if it's more like perceiving and what actually hangs on that distinction. I think similarly, there's a strong overlap to to mind wandering and daydreaming. I guess the short answer would be that for mind wandering, it's typically used in a in a somewhat broader sense, I think. So um, you would have extremely imaginative daydreams would fall under that hitting. But at the same time, things like just thinking about, you know, that you didn't do the dishes or have to do dinner or something like that. A lot of these mundane thoughts actually make up a huge proportion of spontaneous thought and wakefulness. And likewise, I think you would also then have... Um, types of imagination that are more deliberate and that so I think it's a partial overlap and extremely interesting but it just gets a lot more complicated when when one brings in those topics yeah. thank you uh, thank you and don't judge me for this question mm. but a psychedelic um, drugs a legitimate fast track to an enlightenment experience <laughs> <laughs> Do they fire up the same parts of the brain as a decades of meditative practice? <laughs> Not that I'm saying that's what I will do, but I am. <laughs> so I, I don't know enough about them, to tell you the truth. Uh, <laughs> I... I, I, I I, I, re I really don't know enough about them to actually give you a decent answer, so, so sorry about that. So there's an interesting area of exploration. We've got a psychedelic medicines team. Mm. Yes, well, that, that's not what Kevin's been doing in his office uh, there in the, in the centre or what Jakob's been doing in the lab. Uh, I've got a question, and this is not an area of expertise, but it may be that it's switching areas of the brain off that 
kind of give moments of transcendence or clarity, that it's actually what quietens down what stops for a moment. I don't know if anybody here has ever noticed that din going on in the mind and probably Jennifer would be able to talk a great, you know, this sort of the noise, it actually, it maybe switches areas of the brain off <clears throat> rather than switching others on. Um, but there are others who are far more expert than myself that would be able to comment uh, about that. It is one of the, the, the hottest questions right now is whether you can fast track some of this. Mm. Uh, mm. The center works with people who deliver uh, psilocybin, some ma magic mushrooms to rats. Mm. Um, so we're trying to ask them what happens. <laughs> <laughs> the researchers. <clears throat> no, no. Mm. Yes, it turns off, it, it, t it seems that it turns off the kind of top down expectations that you come into a situation with. Um, so allowing sensory input to kind of take on a bigger role. And there's some overlap there with what contemplation is meant to do as well. But there's a long way to go with that. And then the question is, what happens after? A question in the back and then front. Um, my name is uh, David Kobolov. I'm a psychiatrist. And it's a follow-up to Suzanne's question. Um, one of the attractions to... Uh, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy in the patients I see and in um, discussion with others is that it is a sudden, a short road to nirvana. Um, and this idea, um, in contrast to, for example, psychoanalysis, uh, an older form of therapy, a daily psycho psychoanalysis for perhaps years. So it's this desire to have a sudden transformational experience as against the long, long journey of trying to develop insight. So in taking, following on from Suzanne's question, how much is it an illusion to imagine that we can get transformational nirvana in a short period of time, whether it's through meditation or psychedelic assisted psychotherapy as against deeper insight that takes years? Maybe I'll just, um, you know, <clears throat> My, my sense is, you know, I, I know something about the Buddhist tradition, is when you have these insightful experiences, the Buddhist, uh, what they say is you need to go back to the text. You need to think, read again deeply about the insights. You know, what do you do with this sense of unity with the rest of the world? Well, how am I supposed to act given that I have had this? And this kind of, uh, you know, uh, sort of... Uh, support or scaffolding that you need. I mean, Kevin talked about feeling confused after the first. I've had other students um, who do a lot of meditation and, so, you know, when they have these experiences, they've been very confused about it. So, and even with, psych uh, with the psychedelics, as far as I know, you need a lot of CBT follow-up. Um, but it might be my prejudice I don't think it's an easy, I don't think it's as easy as it sounds. You know, if what the aim is, you know, to, to learn to be better, to somehow transform yourself for the better, not just transform yourself, but transform yourself to be better. You could be a better Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, or just a better human. Um, the road, it doesn't seem to me that there would be a quick fix, but. Okay, we'll throw to Ian. And then here and here. Um, if, if you look at how psychedelics have been used traditionally, which most traditions have done, they use them as an entree point. And they weren't used as an ongoing um, treatment. They were used as a, a way of giving people this initial experience that was being asked about and that, Kevin, you've described really well. Um, and I think in modern times, it's actually quite salutary to think about the role of these experiences because if people are actually going to change their minds, then you face the fact that we're creatures of habit and we get into ways of thinking. And all the spiritual paths tend to be fairly long and arduous, actually. Uh, and so it's what motivates people to go down that path. And having one of these awakening experiences is a reliable way to do it. Um, so there seem to be two possibilities 
here for in, in a modern context. And one is that quite a lot of people, when they take up meditation practice, have like a honeymoon period where often they do have one of these awakening experiences because they're not overthinking the practice and they think, oh, I'll just give it a go and see what happens. And a bit like Craig saying, that they actually allow their mind to, to drop and to sort of stop the function and, and these experiences actually reveal themselves. And, you know, if I speak personally, that, that happened to me. I, I had an early experience as a teenager and that sort of propelled me for many years through a lot of arduous sitting, <laughs> which Kevin described. You know, if you're going to sit on your backside for three hours through a lot of pain, you, you want to have some sense of there being some payoff. And and those, those uh, awakening experiences show you the possibility of what it is to be a true human being and do give you an inkling of how that experience can inform your life. So I, I'm, I'm actually of the view that we need to think about how can we foster that sort of awakening experience early for young people particularly when they've got so many distractions to give them a real taste of what this is all about. And I, I, I think that we can do that through particular meditative practices, but I'm, I'm, I'm more coming to the opinion that, that you know, psychedelics may actually be useful, used judiciously for that. And I, 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 I'm, people are always interested. I, I haven't taken psychedelics myself, uh, but I can see that there could well be a place in, in modern times uh, where kids have just got so much distraction and need something major to cut through that. But if they think that just taking psychedelics is going to do it for them, then I think they're um, sorely mistaken and we really need to have the sense that that's an opening and a starting point and it leads on to actually what could be like a quite a serious study and practice. Thank you. <coughs> Question? I think, yeah, breathwork can actually bring about some of these states. Um, I think one of the main things is, though, is if the individual tries these things and this is the thing that works for them, then do that. Like, do that thing. Don't have to worry about, well, this person says to do it this way and the other one says to do it that way. Just do the thing that works for you if you find that this actually does bring about these kinds of clarity and insight into your life and brings about these senses of calm. Do that thing. Uh, you can try these different, you can try many, many different kinds of techniques. That's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But then it, eventually you're going to find something. It's like I, I gel with this technique and this is the thing that seems to work. And so once you've found that thing, yeah, do it, work. It's, it's, I think it's great. It's, and there's so much overlap with like breath work, obviously, and what we do from a very practical Buddhist perspective of watching the breath. It's one of the main practices we have. So, yeah, I think, I think it's fine, yeah. <coughs> I think um, Andrew Corcoran, Dr. Andrew Corcoran, who sits in the back of the room, you saw him in the video, is working within the center on the physiology of how heart rate variability and breath and brain activity hangs together. And one of the things that you're doing, Andrew, if I may, is to look at how breath can entrain heart rate variability in a certain way, but then a similar kind of entrainment can happen if you present images to the eyes and the brain in the same way and train heart rate variability just as breath can do and that speaks to Kevin's point that there are different routes to the same kinds of physiological effects possibly. Uh, question from you. Uh, my question came up after listening to Kevin and Jennifer. Uh, they sounded a bit as if they contradicted each other. I'm sure they haven't. Oh. I don't want them to get into a fight with each other. Maybe there is a complementary way of looking at this. Uh, Kevin sounded like he's saying meditation is when you sit there and you want to be free from all the thoughts. Don't let the thoughts take you. They're distractions. And Jennifer was saying, no, allow these thoughts to take you. The, that's the path, and that's exactly the opposite. You, you, know, you just go with the thoughts. They're not a negative thing to go away from, and, and, and they're not a distraction. So I don't know. <laughs> is, there, is there a complement? Is there possibly a third technique which combines them both together? And, and, and possibly also you know, the, the Jennifer's 
I call it Jennifer's technique, is that something that we can do without just sitting with the eyes closed. We can do it all the time, 24-7 during the day while walking and talking and playing. That's a great point. So I would say our perspectives are, we just have different perspectives. I don't see it as contradictory sure. at all. And I think they can be quite complementary in a number of ways. I think the states that I was <clears throat> talking about, I think there are techniques of channeling them and bringing them about lucid dreaming you can learn to dream lucidly and if you're lucky sometimes that will work and but my point i think was really that that is something that we're doing all the time anyway we can't really prevent it at all it's just something that's really built into the fabric of our mind all the time and i think an extremely interesting question also coming back to a number of the the comments and questions that have been made from the audience so far is that so about psychedelics um, and so on and if you could kind of fast track it is really that we have these states either small scale transformative states and constant change or large scale awakening states they're part of the repertoire of our minds they're already there and there are different ways of bringing them about you might be able to do it psychopharmacal through, through psychedelics or you might be able to have them spontaneously uh, in sleep, or you might be able to cultivate them and you can use different techniques to get them. And it's just a super interesting question, I think, whether where we end up at is then the same or different. So some of the work that, that we've been doing and will continue to do in the center as well with, with Toby Woods at the back of the room, so um, just published a paper on that today, is actually can you compare different contemplative techniques in terms of both the path and then also what he calls the goal stage, where we end up at. Are they the same or different? Um, are the paths maybe more efficient or quicker or slower? Um, and even just understanding that, and I think that question can be broadened beyond contemplation to spontaneous states and drug-induced states and so on and so forth. And I guess the other thing that I would say is, and, and being no great expert on different contemplative techniques, but my understanding, again, largely from working with Toby, is that different contemplative techniques, different meditation styles have different degrees of tolerance for spontaneous states and mind wandering. And some, especially at some stages, something like focused attention will regard them as a distraction, whereas others will be quite tolerant and open to them and just saying, well, that is just part of the practice. So I think, again, a much, a much more complex view is almost something that is needed there. And I think it's all just parts of the puzzles. I've, I've been really fascinated by um, can we just first thank our three wonderful speakers? I hope, Manama, you are satisfied with the substance of what happened. Um, it's a wonderful conversation we've had. We could continue. We have to let real life uh, encroach on us. Uh, the website is up and running. You can subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, we have a Twitter account. Uh, we are very happy to engage with, with all of you. Um, things like uh, Toby's paper published today will be up on the website very quickly. We have open access versions of everything. Um, so there's lots to dive into there. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, for sticking with us this hour of, of, um, of a deep dive into transforming consciousness. I want to thank Jess for putting everything together. Put up your hand, Jess. A wonderful center manager, the team at Erda, the team at Chancellery for, for, for the whole day. I think it's been fantastic. Uh, so thank you, everyone. <laughs>